We'll start off, can you introduce yourself and your work and what you do? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Tim Hinchliffe. I am the editor of The Sociable, sociable.co, and we look at um, tech and society and uh, how um, governments, uh, NGOs, um, unelected global think tanks, defense departments, intelligence agencies uh, develop and uh, deploy technology and uh, the policies and what kind of impact those have uh, on society. Right, so you're kind of looking at more of a the technocratic aspect of things. Yeah, I started off years ago uh, looking at startups and businesses and things and funding announcements and I quickly realized that I that just bored the hell out of me. I wasn't interested at all. And then I started looking at um, uh, what DARPA was doing in the U.S., you know, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, and I started looking at kind of the weird uh, brain tech that was going on and, and espionage and cyber attacks uh, technologies and uh, all those kinds of things really piqued my interest. And so I, I kept looking at and then I also used to look at artificial intelligence like into the lens of mythology and kind of sci-fi stuff. But then I realized, um, yeah, technology can do all these good things and bad things, and a lot of it has to do with policy. So, um, yeah, once I started looking at policy and the way things were being used, that got me in the whole, uh, the whole technocracy kind of thing, and then got into uh, World Economic Forum stuff. Pretty early, in 2016 is when I started paying attention to the World Economic Forum and what they were doing. Yeah, you know, with the World Economic Forum, I saw you wrote about them quite a bit, and I heard someone say a particular argument about them, of like, someone says, World Economic Forum is really bad, and the person replied with like, how can the World Economic Forum, how can you oppose it, because it's just this place, like in Davos, where people go, politicians will go, and they just discuss things, so what's, it, what's inherently bad about the World Economic Forum, like, is it not just this place where people discuss things, how is it actually this corrupt thing based on controlling people and that well i mean it's what they have is uh, influence and, and money um so you know what we see of the sessions from davos or any other kind of the meetings that they have all over the world a lot of it in saudi arabia mm. um no not saudi arabia united arab emirates um is that yeah we what we see is just a little glimpse what goes on really is behind closed doors and yes you have the most powerful people in uh government and business and um, influential people in academia. And we put those people together and you make deals behind closed doors. And the whole basis of the World Economic Forum, what their shtick is, is private, uh, public-private partnerships. And that's just the merger of corporation and state, which some say is uh, corporatism fascism. or fascism. fascism. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's basically that. It, and so they, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of influence, and uh, what they tend to uh, recommend for policies, uh, they just get rubber stamped by governments and businesses, you know, ESG stuff, DEI stuff, and then also everything to do with the whole technocratic control um, aspect. Um, so yeah, they, they, um, they, in and of themselves, no, the World Economic Forum, if it's as an entity, says they demand this, they're going to shut down this. They have no power in that respect, no, no legislative power, you know, no governing power like that. Well, it's influence. They have, they have power. They have influence and money, and, and they can corrupt. Yes. Carl Schwab did say like one of the most influential organizations in the world. I think didn't he? Has I seen that one video of him? Right. Yeah. And uh, in about how he penetrates the cabinets. Yeah, that of, one. Yeah, of, well, of governments. So, it's yeah. got to yeah. some suspicion. <laughs> now, you said deals buying closed doors and things we don't see going on. Now, a lot of people would just say, well, that's theoretical. You can't really prove it. Is there any, like, undeniable, here's something they've done that's, that proves a lot of what we're talking no, about? No, well, I can't see it, like, just off the top of my head. Um, I know, like, if you hear... Um, stories of people who've been to Davos that I can't remember the names of them, just a few of them who actually spoke yeah. out later, like they, they've been the ones saying like, well, what you see isn't really what's going on. And I was there and then I got this weird vibe and these people went behind these doors. I wasn't part of this one. Um, but if you see what happens um, in governments and what, uh, you know, like when they push out things for uh, digital ID, when they push out ESG things, you know, I mean, BlackRock, of course, has a lot to do with it, but they're part of the, the WEF as well. So yeah. um, what, what what you see more of is kind of what they talk about, at least publicly, and then what comes out later down the pipeline, what, what, what becomes of everything, what, what policies come about 
digital IDs, vaccine passports, uh, mm -hmm. all, all these all these kinds of things. Yeah, Net zero way, specifically. Yeah. No matter what you can or cannot prove, there's people in the world that can for I'm saying in public, digital ID so we can see who gets vaccinated or not and talking about, oh, you could eat less meat for the planet. And it's, either way, they're talking about, you know, very suspicious things. Exactly. Yeah. Klaus Schwab often coin, coins the term fourth industrial revolution. What is the fourth industrial revolution? Mm. I don't know what it means. Uh, yeah, he, he wrote a couple books on that. Back in like 2016, it was the fourth industrial revolution. And then I think a year later, it was shaping the fourth industrial revolution. I've read all of his books except for stakeholder capitalism. I haven't read that one. But the fourth industrial revolution, it's um, a, a couple of things. One, it's the, it's the um, it's a conglomeration of all these different technologies um, that include AI. It includes... Um, um, yeah, you know, the metaverse stuff, virtual reality, augmented reality, a lot of different technologies coming together to form this force. And what it will lead to, in his words, is the fusion of our biological, our digital and physical identities. And that's yeah. that's what um, that's what it is. So basically, in the end, he's basically saying it's transhumanism, you know, merging the blurring the lines between the physical, the digital and the biological. Why do you think he wants to do that? <laughs> so, yeah. When I try to assign motive to these people, it yeah. is so weird. It's, it's difficult because I, <laughs> I got to realize that these people don't think like I do. And he's tomorrow is his birthday. Oh, it's Klaus Schwab's birthday. He's uh, going to turn, I think, 84. It's my birthday as well tomorrow. I'm going to turn 39. We have the same uh, birthday. Awesome. Uh, and I kind of think <laughs> seeing myself as an antithetical kind of superhero villain kind of thing. But, um, no, these people don't think the way we do. Um, and also, I don't. He says he's never going to be tired. He's going to work until he dies. But the thing is, you know, when you're going to be dead, what's? Why are you pushing for all these things that can just screw around with humanity? And I think there's a couple of things. Maybe he, he wants to live forever through these uh, <laughs> through these uh, digital means, maybe. Uh, digital immortality. In fact, the very first article I wrote on the Social Bowl was about AI and the Epic of Gilgamesh and digital immortality back in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, there's that and like legacy, I guess. Like people are obsessed with legacy. Like yeah. they want to be remembered. They want to be heroes. They think of like, or maybe they have some kind of messianic complex or something. Um, but it's just, and I've never reached that level of, most of us have of popularity of power that where like money doesn't really mean much you know you just have what you want is power and you want to have influence over yeah. things and people and planet um again it's so tough for me to put a, a a motive on it but that's what's going on and that's what they're doing and i have to think out try to think outside of my own mind on, on these kind of things uh, someone said something like why, why would they want to control... They were saying that at me, like, oh, why would they want to control you? You're a 15-year-old boy. Like, why would they care? Well, that's the whole point. There's, you know, 8 billion of us on the planet. They don't want us. We're the useless eaters, as they say. It's, so, of course, they want to control us. Yeah, we're the, we're the useless we class. Because like, when you have too many people, uh, yeah, it's harder to control. So they want to... You know, and I see a lot of... You know, depopulation definitely is an agenda. Um, and I can see that through a lot of... Um, a lot of people interpret that being as they want to kill us all. Maybe to some extent, you know, parts of it. Uh, they certainly have putting in place things like, uh, well, the whole massively vaccinating entire population without a whole lot of testing or long-term data. Uh, the whole net zero thing, the whole thing about, um, you know, uh, uh, eating less meat and eating fake 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 food basically which will probably poison us as well but then it's also the whole part about um reproduction you know if, you, if you're not going to outright kill someone with uh with war disease pestilence famine or whatever then sterilize you know and then in a couple yeah. of generations that'll take care of it yeah i think so. that's what's been hidden about potentially the covid vaccines because people say that they're, they're killing people the excess deaths i don't really think i feel like that's almost a cover-up i think it's the mm. infertility the sterilization and we are seeing that, I heard a statistic, it's something like by 2050, all men are expected to be infertile. And we're not really being told about that at all. It's yeah, well, I've seen like a lowering of sperm counts and then also yeah. um, just in, in women too, just uh, irregular periods, uh, miscarriages, yeah. um, a whole lot of uh, issues there as well in the past few years. 
Like, those are like trends that are ongoing. Doesn't look like they're going to stop. You know, it's it's only getting worse. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, what is globalism? That's one of the the World Economic Forum because it's world government and UN bringing everyone together, World Health Organization. What is globalism? Uh, to me, so like I was trying to look at these terms like globalization versus globalism, if there is a difference or not. And I was asked this uh, about a year ago from uh, an old friend of mine, like, why do you go after globalism? What do you mean by globalism? Isn't it something good? You know, like we just want to take care of the planet and stuff. But no, globalism to me is in trying to enact a one world government and then trying to get everybody on board with uh, it's, it's a consolidation and centralization of power, basically. You know, it's like uh, you got the European Union. They want to have an African Union. They want to make a union of North North America, you know, Mexico. And, and then once you have all these unions, then you start merging those together. And then you have this one big global union thing. Um, and the thing is, not what's good for the goose is not necessarily good for the gander. So, yeah, what they're doing is imposing top-down, unelected policy uh, and trying to control your lives. This is the way it's going to be. We say that uh, carbon is bad. And um, so and we say that cows farting is bad, cows are bad, all these things are bad. So we're going to, uh, fossil fuels are bad. Like your first show there with, with yeah. Jesper, yeah. <laughs> fossil fuels are bad. Um, so we're going to make everything impoverish you and make you sicker uh, for your own good. That's what I see globalism as yeah. being, is just being it's this nanny state top down thing. And then eventually, you know, if once they get a, if they get a world uh, police force or army, then Jesus, you know, it's done with, you're done with, you know, the, I think, uh, you know, like with all these immigration things going on or migration, illegal migration, and just countries being flooded with um, military age men, uh, yeah. you know, so, you know, if, if, uh, if you need some kind of force that doesn't really care about, uh, you know, they're not loyal to that country that they're in or the area or whatever, you know, or the people, then they're, they're, they're more uh, susceptible to carry out those kinds of acts uh, at the whims of whatever higher um, government there is. Yeah, when you say all this illegal immigration, one of the things they they kind of put it under multiculturalism. And I kind of think mm. it's not that it doesn't it's doesn't it doesn't not like it just doesn't work. It's a complete myth entirely. There's no such thing as multiculturalism. You cannot put multiple cultures and have a culture. One of the kind of analogies I created to myself was, you know, when I was a bit younger, you, you got paint. And you're trying to mix all the paints together and then when you do that you just got like no color it's like just gray or black or something yeah to me that's what multiculturalism right. would be you got no culture yeah it, what i love is um assimilation you know so like uh i, I like uh how the united states became a melting pot but it's not like it was all done through a, a process and a system and over time and to not overwhelm the system and each culture brought in something you know unique and, and uh, uh cool and well and bad parts as well but at the same time, you know, like, uh, uh, <laughs> she reminded of uh, Rowan Atkinson, an old sketch she did a long time ago with uh, talking about uh, 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 Indians and Pakistanis in Britain. He says, like, I like curry, but now that we've got the recipe, <laughs> you know, um, I, I like, uh, so, like, I'm in Colombia. I've been here 10 years. Um, I still carry distinctly American uh, things about uh, beliefs and things, but I assimilate to the culture. I speak the language, I eat the food, I, 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 obey, I abide by the norms, and I did everything legally, you know. But once you have a flood of everything coming in, then you're going to get that dull color that there's no, yep. it, or you're going to get, yeah, total chaos <laughs> is, is what we're seeing. You know, the removal of culture is also just part of globalization. Because if no country is different, all, everything looks the same. Perhaps everybody speaks the same language. Everybody, all this stuff. Then, people are more likely to well, accept yeah, one it, world government. Yeah, that, yeah, you're totally right. That's the, like the end of like ma and pa shops or, or um, you know, uh, local, um, you know, family owned restaurants and things like that. And any little thing of culture, I mean, it gets replaced by big block stores like uh, um, Walmart in the United States. I don't know what you got in uh, Britain, uh, Tesco or something yeah. like that. Like everything turns into. Yeah. Uh, a McDonald's or something or a Starbucks, you know, so yeah, that's horrible that it, it just it, it eliminates choice as well eliminates expression eliminates creativity uh, it eliminates um, Just dreams and possibilities of things that could be because of this corporate machine that just uh, um, Is just in the way and, and what they're doing with farmers even uh, I just saw uh, yesterday in, in in Oregon like they're making it so they're putting new codes and things in regulations for farmers 
and so they have to upgrade everything uh, to be on on par and uh, with all the specs and it's impossible for them because they can't afford it and the policies are ridiculous so what happens is they shutter and it goes to the the big corporations yeah that's that's what that's what it is yeah there's in australia right now they've just passed some sort of digital id bill and they've also had in nigeria with the world bank and imf try to convince them or with the eu or something to get a digital id in australia they've told i think they're telling them it's mandatory they always tell them it's man no sorry no, it's mandatory that they have the choice. It's voluntary. You can do what you want. Is that true? No. <laughs> uh, they always say that at first too. Like in the EU, they're doing a thing with the EU wallet and saying uh, the digital ID wallet and saying that that's uh, voluntary as well. But um, I took a look at India as an example. I wrote an article on this one, uh, um, and their system, Adhar, their digital ID system, was. Uh, I think launched or approved in 2011 launched it's been around for like 10 or 12 years and they always said and it still says to this day that it's voluntary but you can't sign up for a bank account without it you can't yeah. like they start they, and government agencies started mandating it for different uh, for, yeah. for different services and benefits of course uh, from the government as well um, and then what happens like I was seeing like throughout the story in the timelines of Adhar is that the government would always start saying, all right, it's mandatory for this, this, and this. And then the Supreme Court would have to come in and like, no. But in the meantime, all these people were, were signing up for, for the digital ID because their lives were being made miserable. They couldn't function in society yeah. without it. And for the government, it's like, okay, you know, yeah, we'll say it's voluntary. Then we'll just totally blatantly do a 180 and, and, and just contradict ourselves and do the opposite. And then once we get caught, the, the courts are slow. But during this time, this policies are still in place, so boom, more people sign up, and now yeah, all of India, I think 1.4 billion people are, are signed up on the digital ID. 1.4 billion volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Technically, it's voluntary. They don't have to. You know, it's like the COVID vaccine. They never technically man or force you to get the vaccine. Sure, you couldn't travel. You might get fired from your job. You can't eat what you want to eat. You can't go into a shop, but you didn't have to. And that's it's completely an illusion because. Yep. it's not really oh yeah i mean voluntary. what happened with me in, in colombia um i uh it was a couple of years ago um on december 14th two like just before christmas i was about to fly back to the united states and they they that's when they said all right mm. you need a vaccination to get into the country i could leave but i couldn't get back in um so i had to cancel my flight i had to can't i couldn't view family as uh, i had a, a nephew who leukemia uh, at the time and and he died on January fifth, just a couple days later, I missed his last Christmas and all that. So it, and that's because yeah, of that was that's because uh, of the whole vaccine stuff. Yes, that's they, they wouldn't let me. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, but I decided. I mean, I could have gone there, but I would have had to stay in the U.S. I mean, I had all my stuff, my job, my part, like paying rent, everything in in Colum it, I couldn't come back in the country, so like I had to stay. It, it, for that, for that reason, just for bodily autonomy. Yeah, so it's not entirely surprising. Yeah, that, that was tough. So that's upsetting. It's upsetting, but it's not entirely surprising. I've heard so many different stories of that. You know, like one recently, it was some woman, and to visit her dad, she had to get the vaccine. She got one. Now she's paralyzed. It's like, oh, it's uh, not. Yeah, that's the other thing too. It's like if I, I could have taken the, you know, the risk, it's something, maybe something, not, nothing would have happened to me if I would have taken the jab or not, or who knows, or maybe I would have been the next one in the family to get super sick and then, you know, not be around anymore. So, yeah, it, you know, it, it was a tough time. Yeah, you know, you might have been fine, but the thing is, you're not just getting vaccines just for the sake of it. Oh, why not? It's like it's not something you just do for fun. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make yeah, it's sense. something because I, I I studied it early on. I saw the like, I went on to all the um, AstraZeneca, BioNTech, um, Pfizer, uh, Moderna. I went on to all their sites, looked at all the stuff about um, who's being affected, uh, who's dying, who's being hospitalized, who's being sick. And I know the numbers were inflated. Uh, you know, who yeah. <laughs> whoever was died with COVID and not of it. But, you know, I saw that early on, all right, it's old people and obese people, and that happens anyway with the flu, and the average age of dying from it was like, what's past life expectancy anyway? So yeah. I said, okay, at first, I'd, I'd just rather have COVID. And then when I saw all the study, uh, everything from the, the manufacturers themselves saying that there's 
we have no uh, 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 about transmissions, like um, further investigation is needed. Is what they were saying at the time. They never said until that in the EU Parliament when the Dutch guy uh, MEP asked, you know, like, did you ever actually test for a transmission? They said no. That was the first time. Like they always, because I, I always looked at the, the studies and they said uh, more investigation is needed. That's all they would say. Yeah. But they never said they never tested it at all. So I looked at that. Okay, if it doesn't stop transmission, there's no evidence that it stops. It has been proven to stop transmission, and I am not at risk. And why the hell would I want to take this? Plus, they changed the definition of uh, immunization and vaccine um, on the CDC website uh, just during that time as well, yeah. because a vaccine used to be something that uh, uh, it provides immunity. Then they changed it to protection. And, oh. and, so yeah, I, I, just, I saw everything like yours, and I kept, you know, saying these things, reporting it, and showing it, and then I, you know, uh, uh, Google started demonetizing everything. I was uh, uh, Google ads on on the articles, and then talking with friends and family, and then they were just telling me, calling me uh, conspiracy theorists and crazy and, and stuff like that. And so, yeah. yeah, it was it was tough. I felt alone for for a couple, like especially 2020, 2021, 2022 was like. And a lot of the stuff that I was writing and putting out there, like, it, it was met with, eh. but then, like, a year later, all of a sudden, an article become popular, like, oh, my God, he was right. That was right. That was right. That was right. And, and that's what's happening with a lot of uh, people in this space is that people have been, even before I caught on, were warning about this stuff, um, and they're being vindicated. Yeah, you just got to hope these people that didn't know at the beginning, but now they now know aren't going to fall for it again whenever the next big thing happens because they might they might just fall for it again but there's also a lot of people who are silent on yep. their behavior and actions of what and how they treated uh people skeptics and unvaccinated people like they wanted to throw us in jail they wanted to you know deny us health care they wanted us to be the first to die and whatever and they they just lost their minds and went insane and then what was it, a year ago is when that article came out let's declare a pandemic amnesty <laughs> for yeah. all the things like you wanted to crucify us and burn us at the stake okay yeah yeah a little crazy there for a sec didn't it yeah we forgive you oh. <laughs> yeah now moving back to the, the un all these things i've heard people use the term un world health organization left treaty or, uh, tribe and like cult or this are they really all connected or is that just some sort of myth? Well, um, obviously, uh, the U, uh, UN, the WHO is part of the UN, so definitely oh, there. Yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, the UN partners with the WF all the time, so like on initiatives, and uh, so the, yeah, they they are connected. They have the same goals, um, and also like the people associated with these these little groups. You know, like um, who funds the WHO? You know, like the number one. Bef when Trump Trump got him out of got the U.S. out of uh, funding for a little for a sh momentarily, and the number two I think was like uh, either Great Britain or it was uh, Bill Gates. I think it was Bill Gates was number two, and then Great Britain, and then Germany, and then um, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, which is mm. Gates funded, which came out of the World Economic Forum as well. <laughs> so um, yeah, they're all completely uh, entwined. They have the same goals. Um, and they want, you know, the UN wants the One Health thing. Uh, the WF wants global governance and, and all these things. And yeah, they're just, yeah. Um, they, they work together. They partner on things, basically the same thing. It, yeah. yeah. So either way, <laughs> I, the I, I thing. wanted to, I, I think the, you know, the, whatever, I mean, the UN came about from the League of Nations, you know, years ago after World War II. And then, you know, set up by the Rockefellers, um, who was also, you know, involved in uh, big pharma, big steel, big oil, uh, everything, all about monopolies and control. Yeah. So this is this. It's, it's back to its roots. It's all. It's always been about that. Yeah. What is the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Some call it Agenda Twenty Thirty because it sounds good. It sounds like you know, yeah. no poverty, nobody's gonna be starving, everything's gonna be good, life on land, life on water. But what's the truth of it? Well, it, in order to have all that, it. It's about moving goalposts and changing definitions and things. So um, I forgot who I was talking to. Maybe it was, I think it was Russell Brand like last year um, when, when uh, we were talking about uh, 
you know, eliminating poverty. And so, well, if you just make everybody poor and then get them on a, a universal basic income yeah. from the government linked to their CBDC digital ID, then you can say, boom, we eliminated poverty. Well, how do you do that? You got to yeah. enact uh, totalitarian uh, things. And same with the food systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the weird one is that the right to identity, I think it was like goal 16.2 uh. or whatever. Like, okay, everyone should have an identity, but then they, they just like took that off to have a uh, digital identity, which yes. isn't part of it, but that's what they're interpreting it as. Yeah. So everyone has the right to be, like be a part of a nation and, and like have, you know, have a state and, and, you know, be a part of a state yeah. and have an ID and, and that, but then they translate that to digital identity. So yeah. um, no, the, all these things are, yeah, they sound wonderful. And, uh, but the, the way they go about it, you know, <laughs> it, it, if you look at, uh, the results, the, the means and then the ends and what that actually looks like. Um, it's just spells disaster for, for civilizations, for humanity. Yeah. Um, and plus, you know, like uh, once again, you can't, if you do this on like what's good for Africa or is not good for North America, which is not good for here, or things are different, you know, and, and it's, it just doesn't work it just, without yeah. totalitarian control. I think the final goal is like, partnership for the goals or something like that which is also just globalization so it's again no better no just public private partnerships until there's there's it's it's always um these uh blurring of polarities like uh, there's in, in um hermetic philosophies teaching it's kind of esoteric is this principle of polarity where there is no you know what's the difference between hot and cold what's the difference between dull and sharp you know it's just a spectrum and so everything, all truths are but half truths, and yeah. all paradoxes could be reconciled in that way, which is that that teaching. And so that's when I see when they blend public private, they're they're having two opposites, but they're making it the same thing, and that just confuses you even more. Uh, yeah. Transhumanism, machine, human, blending those things. So and you can see that like and in lots of things they do, they give you a half truth. They say this is what's going on. Well, yeah, the opposite is also true. So when you read, uh, especially World Economic Forum. Um, uh, what they're what they're pushing is everything that just sounds so rosy, but they're only giving you half truth. The the opposite is also true. Yeah, and so with digital ID, how do we avoid it? Because sure, so people will say there's all these twenty thirty goals, but it's already twenty twenty four, and there's there's no way that they can do it so soon because I mean there's not really any restrictions on anything we meet. And one of the things I say, I don't like to spread hopelessness because without hope, we're, we're all just going to surrender, put arms up, can't, can't do anything about it. But it's like, they could just pay a bunch of arsonists for one summer, destroy the food supply potentially, and go, guys, look, it's climate change. We've, we've, got, we've got to have all the power. We've got to accept digital ID because you keep, it's you that's causing this. It's your fault. And by then, literally in just two years, four years before 2030, they could have digital ID. So is there any way to actually avoid this? Well, yeah. And plus it doesn't have to, yeah, it can be, they're, they're trying it on every single front. What's, you know, whatever to, to push it in. It's, it's, um, migration they, or even, uh, yeah. So just regular immigration in migration and then, uh, climate refugees, as they say, uh, cyber attacks, another one, they want to bring in digital ID, like if some kind of cyber attack brings something down. So now we need to identify people for that. Getting onto the logging into your passport to the internet and metaverse, they want that to be digital ID. So, mm -hmm. Um, digital ID for health, digital ID for travel, digital ID for all these things. So how do you get out of it? Um, I'm not someone who has all the answers, a lot of solutions, unfortunately. But uh, one thing I do and we're doing right now is just spreading awareness and more people are waking up to it. Another one is um, legislative processes uh, in different countries. So, I mean, in the United States, for example, like a couple of states already, I think I've already said, we're not going to allow a CBDC. You know, uh, other ones I think are looking at, uh, you know, we're not going to allow digital ID here, you know, in, in small areas. And then once that starts, you know, to blossom a bit, I don't have too much hope for like the European Union mm. or kind of like Australia, Australia or pretty much a lot of places in Asia. Um, but uh, at least even even and I've seen um, through the different sessions in the UN and in W and WEF um, about the United States, and they're saying how tricky it would be to, to do a CBDC to get people to accept it, just uh, 
because of yeah. <laughs> freedom, love, and nature <laughs> kind of yeah. thing. But you know, but then something like COVID happens, and I saw yeah. what happened in the United That's, States uh, as well. People lost their minds. So it's like, so if there, if you get enough fear, you know, if, if something scares the shit out of people, then you know, it yeah. might, uh, you might have that that narrow window, as Schwab said, to yeah. enact a great reset. But they couldn't do it at uh, in 20, they they tried yeah. they wanted to, they wanted the, it, the disease wasn't deadly enough it didn't kill children um so it yeah it, they they uh yeah gates was it, lamenting that as well it really does just take one crisis though because you know for example they could say we'll never mandate a vaccine but if a disease comes well now all of a sudden people are going to accept it so with what i said about digital id we've seen arson that's happened to try and convince us all about climate change if if there's like no food in the shops and they say the only way to cure this is to stop the climate change and accept digital ID, we're not gonna sit here and starve. So like most people are gonna fold. People during COVID folded and went, okay, fine, I'll get a vaccine because they were offered a free burger. So if you're no food, there's a good chance you're gonna be like, fine, I'll accept it. And and I think there's gonna be a there's a big disparity, a big difference between uh, rural and urban. Um, so people who are in cities, they're completely dependent on, yeah. um, you know, just the system, like the grocery store, that's where the food is. That's, you know, the money system. And that's what we do. Um, you know, digital money or credit cards, scan, you know, whatever. Um, like, for instance, I'm out here in the countryside in Colombia and everything is paying cash um, and then or we trade things. So, like, I've got some chorizos. You know, there's the goat lady who comes by with, with the goat milk and the goat cheese, you know, yeah. and so we, we kind of, if you build those small communities and, you know, support, you know, local farmers and stuff, then that, that kind of thing, it's like, it's a per, creating a parallel economy, a parallel system. It's, I know this is kind of sounding more like a, 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 a anarchist kind of thing. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not an activist. I'm not, I just, uh, just wanted to be left alone. That's how I got into more of this, um, uh, why I'm pushing the way I am because they keep they keep coming after me and they just won't leave me alone. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, building you know communities and just knowing you know someone who who has access to things and you you also yourself providing some kind of source of value uh, yeah. in case shit goes wrong. Um, just being uh, in you know um, being smart you know being part of a community but also being smart and as 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 independent as you can, self sustaining as you can. Yeah, it's all based on reliance because reliance is almost just like blackmail so if you need them they can just say you know if you don't do this then we'll do this no more money that's why they want digital id because or central bank digital currencies or universal basic income if you need them in order to put food on the table then they can say if you don't do this well we'll reduce your rations or so something crazy but they'll do it they, they will do it so. I also think that also during these you know times of crisis is, is when yeah a lot of people lay down but then some people stand up in a really big way um, and then they can uh, come up with new ideas and, and uh, show show a different path you know like I, it's hard for me to see it, what that is right now but you know it's uh, when when the time comes that's when people you, you know you see their true colors and then some some people can really shine um, and yeah I, I have I, I have somewhat faith in, in, in that as well yeah although faith, faith alone can do everything of course I, I think we need to do we need to look at solutions and all these things i i struggle though I, I sometimes think is is there any way but either way what else can i do i could just do nothing that's definitely no better so 